thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is a nice yeah, crowd to see. And uh, my name is Harold Solomon. I have never, never been published in communications biology or any other nature journal. I've never been published. And the only reason I'm introducing George is Andres couldn't make it. However, I work uh, commercial helping researchers commercialize their work and create start up companies uh, from their work. And without a high impact journal article, that commercialization becomes very hard. So I know the value of uh, what George can present to you firsthand by seeing how wonderfully the technology is initially received because of the credibility that a high impact journal uh, gives your research. So I, I know it's a very important message to hear. Uh, George is actually from down the street. He, he did his uh, PhD in the genetics of epilepsy at Emory before he went to uh, communications biology three years ago. So I'll turn you over to George. And since I'm not able to stay uh, for this, if you ask a question, we're recording this. Uh, I'm going to put my microphone down on the table. Please grab the mic and ask your question into the mic so that the future uh, listeners uh, to this presentation can hear your question as well as George's response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a microphone. So hopefully, OK, I think the microphone's picking me up. So thank you for that very kind introduction. My name is George Inglis. I'm a senior editor at Communications Biology, the full definition of which will be unveiled very shortly. But to provide kind of a brief outline for like this chat today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about who are editors and how and the role that they play in the um, academic publishing process, an introduction to the nature portfolio of journals and kind of an overview of the different bars or considerations for each one of those journals, and then an overview of the publication process and what happens from when you click submit to a journal system um, up until acceptance. And then I'll leave plenty of time for, for questions and discussion. And I know we also have kind of a trainee lunch and learn session after, that, uh, after this, um, so we can continue uh, other questions or discussion then. So just to dive in, um, I'll start off by talking about who are editors. And so editors at academic research journals are PhD trained scientists who as by virtue of their graduate and postgraduate training, have personal firsthand knowledge with publication as authors of their own publications or reviewers for publications from colleagues. And as a result of that academic training, that means that they have both the ability to evaluate manuscripts in the context of their field and also summarize and disseminate those findings um, to perhaps non-experts in the field. Also as a result of our academic training, oh, I think, there's a little bit of feedback. Um, but as a result of our academic training, we do understand um, the, the main challenges within our respective fields um, and barriers to publication. But most of us have moved into the editorial life um, or editorial careers because we typically have interest beyond the, uh, the very focused subjects that we studied in our PhD or in our postdoc. Um, and in our current roles, we're motivated to help authors find the best possible uh, audience and best possible home for their research. So as um, was briefly mentioned in that introduction, uh, my path to becoming an editor was I actually did my um, bachelor's degree in biology at Penn State University, where um, I actually was in microbiology research and then did a big pivot to uh, the uh, genetics of epilepsy during my PhD at Emory in the genetics and molecular biology program there. And I actually graduated, uh, or I defended right before COVID, but I graduated during COVID. So um, we didn't have a formal graduation ceremony then. Um, it was like all on Zoom. So before I left the lab, I went in with my uh, with my robe, and normally you'll get like this hood, but if you look closely for anyone who does animal surgeries, you may notice that this is not an Emory branded graduation hood. This is a surgical, this, this is like surgical cloth. Um, but I joined the team at Communications Biology in 2020, so I've been there for almost three years, uh, and I'm based uh, typically in New York. Um, and one reason why I wanted to move to the editorial life, and I'll get to this in the trainee lunch and learner a bit more as well, is one of the, the, my favorite parts about my PhD program was that 
my focus was in genetics, but there was kind of an overarching umbrella structure. It was, it, it's a long acronym, but it's called GDBBS. Um, and there were seven other programs where you could interface with faculty, you could go to seminars, and I really liked having that breadth of exposure um, to different topics in scientific research. And while like, the, the title of my dissertation may imply that I focused on two genes, and those two genes, voltage-gated sodium channels, SCN1A and SCN8A, will always have a special place in my heart. Um, I think it's really refreshing uh, and really kind of awe-inspiring to be able to see the other kinds of research and get exposure to other aspects of neurogenetics as an editor. And so in terms of the day-to-day -day life of editors, you can break this down broadly into like four different categories. The first of which is manuscript handling. And so papers will be submitted to our desk or inbox, and we read through those, we write an assessment of that paper and how it fits into the literature. And then uh, depending on the criteria of our journal, um, we send that out to peer review, um, and eventually those papers could get published in our journal. And at every stage of the editorial process, this is something that I'll emphasize time and time again, we act as a liaison between authors and reviewers. So if there's ever something that you have a question about, the editor is there to answer it and hopefully provide clarification. Another aspect of the job is keeping on top of the field and making sure we don't live in our own little journal bubbles. Um, because we want to make sure that we're aware of all the research that's being done out there rather than just what is submitted to our own journals. So this is very much kind of an academic adjacent career where I still go to conferences, I'll still go to institutions like right now, um, and read papers from other journals and publications to make sure that I can keep on top of what's, uh, what's going on or what's, what, what are new advances in my field. And then we also have uh, kind of uh, a catch-all category of special projects or more administrative tasks, where based on new priorities in the field, we may reach out to authors and directly commission commentary style articles. We may organize collections to kind of shine a spotlight on certain areas of research, or even organize conferences um, or other special events to, to highlight advances in particular fields. And the journey of a paper does not just end at acceptance. So one of our jobs is to make sure that once a paper is published, it can reach the broadest audience possible. And so we'll actually write up press releases or interface with um, press teams or science reporters to, to write up press releases for, um, for our published papers. And then we're also there to kind of maintain papers in perpetuity. So if there's ever an update that needs to be made to a paper, if there's ever a concern that's raised about a paper that's published in our journal, we're there to handle that correspondence and oversee those corrections. So just to provide a couple of examples of this in terms of special projects, for pitching papers for, for press release, um, like one paper that I had written a release about which got a lot of coverage last year, um, this is just one of the many punny uh, headlines <laughs> that came up to it. But basically, researchers at the University of Florida took Arabidopsis and grew it in um, samples of lunar soil to see if it could actually be supported by lunar soil. Um, and I think a lot of press were like, oh, this means we can like, grow plants on the moon. And I, I, one, one caveat I want to point out is that the plants could grow, but their transcriptomic signature said they were really stressed out. So they, probably, they can grow, but probably can't grow very well. Also, this was done on Earth where there's oxygen and everything. Um, we also will develop collections, as I said. So I've overseen a launch of several collections, including a recent call for, the bio for papers on the biology of Mendelian disorders. And one of the really fun aspects of the job is we have a lot of leeway in reaching out to researchers for more personal stories or doing Q&As, like a recent q and I did with researchers at um, Oxford and Cambridge on the importance of data sharing, particularly in the context of genome-wide association studies. Um, but I think it's also important to distinguish what professional editors do not do. And the first part is our main job is to evaluate how a paper fits into the broader literature rather than the technical details of the manuscript. That's actually what we rely on reviewers for. Reviewers have expertise in particular methods or um, are much more familiar with the intimate, the, like, the intimate literature of a topic. We also don't count referee votes um, because votes are treated more, or sorry, reviews are treated more as arguments um, rather than votes. So if you say have three reviews for a paper and two say that a paper should be rejected, but then it also turns out that the reviewers are basically saying the authors need more detail in the methods or they, they just need to make like what they're doing clearer, that's not a very compelling argument to reject a manuscript because it's basically telling the authors do some proofreading. 
Um, and then we also don't accept papers because they're quote unquote about a hot topic, if they're impactful, or for, from a prominent author just because we judge the paper for the science that's presented and not from, for who it's from because even prominent institutions or authors may not always produce uh, the best research. And I also want to point out, at least in my experience, a distinction between science editing and science writing, where science editing is more about reading papers than writing about papers, whereas science writing is literally, writing is literally in the job title. Um, most of the things that I write will then reach a technical audience where I'll write literature reviews or technical manuscript assessments, um, and sometimes I'll write research highlights of studies that have been published in other journals that then pop up in communications biology or press pitches. Um, whereas science writing, depending on if you're a popular science writer or a medical writer, this can go to either a popular layperson or a, or a technical audience. And for science editing, we mostly focus on the data in a manuscript and the context of a manuscript, whereas science writing can focus on the story of the researchers and the story behind how a manuscript got written. And so kind of after going over that overview of editors themselves, let's dive into the nature portfolio of journals. So the nature portfolio is a broad uh, collection of, um, I wanna say it's 40 plus journals? I forget the specific number. Um, but it consists of our flagship journal, Nature, and the Nature Research Journal series. So it's like Nature X. So in this case, Nature Biomedical Engineering or Nature Genetics. There are also more open access options, meaning that uh, these are specifically gold open access, meaning that any paper published in these journals is available free of charge for anyone to read. You can send it to your grandparents. You can send it to your parents for them to read. They may not read it, but at least they have the option to. Um, and that includes Nature Communications, the communication series of journals to which I belong, and then also scientific reports. We also have open access options in what's called the Nature Partner Journal series, um, and that's a series of journals that are primarily hand, are managed um, for hyper-specialist topics by external editors, so full-time research faculty at various institutions. And in terms of how or what each of these journals will look for, Nature, our flagship journal, um, is very interdisciplinary, covers, uh, considers research, any, any kind of research related to science. But that means that their audience has to be of the broadest importance to any scientist. So if you are a geneticist and there's a neuroscience paper that's published in Nature, even though you don't work in that field, you should understand why it is important to others in that field. Nature research journals, again, like Nature Genetics, Nature Biomedical Engineering, et cetera, these are the most relevant advances in a particular field. So something in, um, say, nature biomedical engineering would be of relevance to any biomedical engineer. Nature communications offers slightly more um, specialized uh, publications where it may not be relevant to all biomedical engineers, but most. Um, and the communications journals is a series that provide that caters to more specialist or sub-communities of research. Um, so it could be, say, researchers focused on a particular disease or a particular disease model, rather than everyone in a particular field. And Scientific Reports focuses more on well-done research rather than the advance or novelty of the research being presented. The communications journals, obviously, like, I'm from communications biology, so I'm mostly going to talk about communications biology. But I will say we are a portfolio currently of eight journals. Um, the newest editions, which is why they don't have like the, the, the same cover logo as us, are communications engineering and communications psychology. Um, communications biology, as the name would imply, is an open access option for biologists. We consider everything under the realm of biology from basic to translational research. And we're the, uh, at, much like the rest of the communications journal series, we're an option uh, for publications in more specialized or interdisciplinary topics, um, which also means that while we have uh, lower criteria for what we consider impactful research than Nature Communications or that Nature branded jur research journal series, we do look for manuscripts that provide an advance even if to a specialist community. And um, we recently celebrated our fifth anniversary, which is why the number five is here multiple times. And I will say, um, perhaps some of this may 
be a bit of redundant information depending on, I, I don't know who, like what labs are in the room currently or what labs will look over this presentation later, um, but we have published uh, research from labs within the Georgia Tech community in biomedical, um, chemical, and molecular engineering, and also from the School of Atmospheric Science in the past as well. And currently, um, Communications Biology, our team is staffed by 10 full-time uh, editors like myself. We're all PhD trained scientists, um, split across New York, Berlin, Madrid, and London. Um, and we have diverse expertise. So my background is mostly in genetics and neuroscience. But we also have editors in structural biology, immunology, cell biology, et cetera, so that we can cover the breadth of biology submissions that come to our journal. But we're unique, and this is true also the communication series as a whole, where we have a collaborative editorial model, where I, this data is current because I updated it like three days ago. Um, but we have 130 editorial board members who are split across um, 30 different countries across the world. And these are full-time research faculty who will also act in an editorial capacity where they may handle a subset of papers um, that relate to their own expertise or to their own research. Um, but they work closely with the in-house editors who are making sure that we are consistent in our decisions and can, being consistent across the scope of research that we consider. Um, these editorial board members also uh, will guide editorial policy um, and different editorial initiatives. So for instance, I keep clicking this, but it's not actually linked to my laptop. Um, for instance, uh, editorial board members will advise us on editorials or new kind of uh, considerations for the journal, but they can also propose initiatives like collections. So one of our editors in our cancer section, Ruby Huang at National Taiwan University, really spearheaded one of our recent calls for papers in cancer spatial biology and is acting as a guest editor and really overseeing or championing this line of research in our journal. Um, and I guess this is more of a plug for, for the future, but if anyone's ever interested in the editorial board, please let us know. And I will be sure, I, I recognize there's a bit of irony in putting links in a presentation when no one can like click a screen here. Um, so I will be sending the slides out to Christina for later so that you can actually click on hyperlinks. And so with that introduction to the Nature Portfolio and editors, I wanted to go over the publishing process as a whole. And so, this really starts in terms of finding a journal to submit your paper to. And I've given you kind of a broad overview of what different journals will look for and their different audience. But a few considerations when you're picking a journal would be first, how big is your story? And then what is the audience that you want to reach? Um, so is it something that is of direct relevance to everyone in a field, or does it have more specialist uh, appeal? And in terms of the audience, you may also want to consider is um, open access, an option that you want to pursue or something you want to, um, something that you want uh, to use to maximize the audience for your paper. Um, in that uh, Nature and the Nature Research Journal series do off offer subscription-based or open access options, um, but they're not gold open access journals like Nature Communications or others in the Nature portfolio. And you also want to consider the timeline for your publication, because if you submit something to Nature or uh, one of the research journals, it may go through multiple rounds of major revisions. And what that means is that each stage, there may be requests for more experimental data. Um, whereas at other journals, like Nature Communications or Communication Series Journal, it may be one round of major revision, um, and then additional rounds where we ask you to discuss more of limitations or uh, or, or address those concerns without necessarily having to acquire new data. And so if it's a case where you have a paper and you want to get it published in, um, like, like so that you can graduate and go on to a postdoc in a year's time, that may be something to consider when choosing a home journal. And I will say, um, as like a, an insider pro tip, if you're ever curious about whether a paper is within a journal scope or may match, say, a collection at a journal, you can always contact one of the editors at that journal. Um, we do, every journal will have a page saying, like, this is our editor team. And it should have a list of editor emails there. So you can just contact the most relevant editor or contact um, just the journal, uh, the journal inbox as a whole and say, this is the abstract or here's an attached version of my paper. If you have the time to look over it, I would appreciate your input on whether this is something that might be of interest to you. Um, the editors may say they 
would, they, like the worst thing that can happen is they'll say, well, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the time this week to look over the paper because we have to prioritize papers that are directly submitted to us. Um, but I can say that this definitely is within our scope. So if you submit it, I'll take a look over it in more detail. And the, once you choose a journal to submit to, um, an overview of the editorial process here is that a journal, or sorry, an article will be assigned to a member of an in-house team, um, or perhaps for, say, a journal like the Communication Series, an editorial board member who, uh, who consults with an in-house editor. Um, they will do write up an assessment of this paper, consult with at least one other editor on the team. Um, we do not work in isolation. And then choose whether to reject the paper or send it out to peer review. That decision will typically take place in five to nine days. Um, and if it's sent out to peer review, we would then contact at least two, ideally three reviewers, possibly more depending on how many different kinds of data are involved, and uh, aim to get their input and give you an updated decision within 30 to 45 days of submission. And after a paper has gone through peer review, it may be rejected, um, and I'll go over the concerns that would lead to a reject decision later. It may be invited for a revision, or if it's already been through multiple rounds of peer review, it may ultimately be accepted for publication. And so in this initial stage of the editorial evaluation, you will have a clear uh, point of contact. You'll be assigned what's called a handling editor. Um, so if I'm listed as the editor on your paper, I'm there to answer any questions you have at any stage of the process. And so that editor will read through the entire manuscript um, and then basically we write up like a one page summary of the paper and how it relates to other papers in the field. If I have a paper, it, for every paper that I look at, I probably will read through at least two or more other papers to see how it fits into recent publications on that topic. And then based on that assessment, I'll talk with at least one other person on my team um, to decide whether or not this is something that we, we're interested in and we'll send to peer review. And again, we know that um, one of the worst things that can happen is for your paper to kind of sit in this void in journal submission. So we do aim to be as uh, efficient and as timely as possible and send out these updates to you within a week of submission. I will say um, cover letters are something that editors read. Uh, the cover letter um, for, I, I think most people with their submission will either put their abstract or I've seen more recently people will copy and paste their introduction into the cover letter. Um, and I'll say, I don't think cover letters can hurt your submission, but they definitely can help. And since we do read a full paper, um, that means we also already read your abstract and introduction. So we don't need to read it again in the cover letter. Um, this cover letter is basically a chance for you as a human being to talk to the editor who's also a human being and really point out what you think the novelty or the main advance of your paper is. And so this can even be a couple of bullet points. It does not have to be particularly long where you can say here are the two or three main takeaways we hope that readers would have from our paper. And this is also a chance where if you're aware of recent publications in the field um, that may kind of overlap with your paper. This is a chance for you to say, we know this paper just came out, or we know that this is similar in scope to another paper, but we'd like to point out the following distinctions. And you can do this again in bullet points. Um, and so, and the last part of the cover letter is you can actually suggest reviewers to look over the paper, which we'll consider, or you can list up to typically six reviewers that you would like to exclude from the peer review process, no questions asked. Um, I will say, uh, do not suggest reviewers who have an active conflict of interest with you, and that means they've either published with you in the last five years or at the same institution. And we ask that you not exclude entire institutes uh, because depending on, like people do this, um, depending on the, the field and the topic, if you, include, if you exclude an entire institute, you may then exclude all, uh, all eligible reviewers <laughs> for your manuscript. Um, in terms of the papers that we do send out for peer review, um, the main criteria are that they would be relevant to your journal scope. So in the context of communications biology, I, uh, like, as the name again implies, we consider biology papers, and we consider theoretical biology as well, as long, or more mathematical uh, papers, as long as they have some sort of biological uh, application. We do not, however, consider just proofs that have no biological application, and we have gotten those submissions before. 
Um, we also consider the significance of the findings, meaning how does this advance what is currently known about a topic, and then also provide strong support for the conclusions. So does the data support the conclusions? So strong contenders for review then would address an important question for the field or provide some sort of advance. It will tell us something new in terms of that subtopic and provide both well-controlled data and rule out clear alternative hypotheses. And then if this is a methods paper, um, we may not expect always, say, a conceptual advance. Uh, it doesn't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of what that kind of method can do. But it should provide a technical advance, meaning that it has to be directly compared to other methods to show how it outcompetes them. Reasons we may reject a paper without peer review mean that it could be that the topic is just outside of the journal scope. Um, or more commonly, it's that it overlaps too much with what we already know based on the current literature. Other reasons could be that there are the key conclusions um, or the key advances actually lack direct exper experimental support. Um, there could be field-specific criteria that are missing, or in rare cases, there could be concerns about ethical approval for that study. But we do send papers out to peer review, um, I'm happy to say. And we do then recruit at least two, perhaps more, peer reviewers to look over the manuscript. And so when we look for these peer reviewers, we make sure that they have expertise within the field uh, or within the, the area represented by that manuscript. We look for reviewers who are both uh, constructive in their feedback, have no clear conflicts of interest, and are detail-oriented, and are familiar with their journal standards. At the same time, when we're looking for reviewers, we're trying to make sure that we're not just reaching out to the same people each time. We look for, for diversity in terms of geography, in terms of background, in terms of career stage. We're, I will say we're very happy to accommodate peer reviews from postdocs or from PhD students to co-review with their advisors. And we honor author exclusions within reason. As I said before, we'll typically consider up to six names, um, but we may not honor the, the exclusion of an entire university. And we'll involve as many reviewers as needed to look over the paper. Um, I will say the, the general standard is three reviewers, but there may be times where we recruit a, review, a reviewer just to comment on one method or one aspect of the paper, and if we, rather than the, the paper as a whole, and uh, there have been times where I've recruited up to four or five reviewers to comment on a paper. Um, I think the most reviewers I've ever had on a paper is six, um, but that's because four of them were uh, all the same review with one PI and three trainees. Um, and we do uh, look out for, basically, if peer reviewers violate the trust of the authors or violate the trust of the editors, we are alert to any um, inappropriate re reviewer behavior. And I will say, we, um, reviewing is not always an easy task, so we are happy to recognize and promote reviewers. And one initiative we have for that at Com Comms Bio is a reviewer of the month where we actually highlight someone who's provided an outstanding review to us in the past. I will say, um, outside of Reviewer of the Month, uh, this, and this is true of Nature Portfolio Journals as a whole, we offer ORCID recognition for peer reviews. Um, so that means that if you review for a Nature Portfolio Journal, you can link your ORCID um, and, say, and basically get a statement that says, I reviewed for X journal this many times in this year. Um, unless you opt in, uh, you will not have your name associated with a particular paper at the time of publication, and your name will never be associated with a specific review. So even if a paper says like, oh, this person reviewed this paper, we'll never say that person was review number one or two. So anonymity is guaranteed. And I will say this is also true if there's a trainee that peer reviews um, with their advisor. We give trainees their own review portals so that you can link reviews to your ORCID and get credit for that. When we do get these, uh, the final reviewer assessment, I think, um, to a certain degree, editors will actually review the reviewers, um, meaning that we rely on reviewers to provide kind of the technical insight uh, on the paper, um, the, uh, the, uh, more information on the experimental design methods and the quality of the data. But they do uh, advise in terms of, is this something that would be of interest to the journal or to the field, um, and how it impacts future research? And again, we consider arguments, not votes. Um, and at the end of the day, it's up to the editor to make the final decision on how we proceed with a paper. 
Um, and in terms of, and editors will, uh, can and will customize those decisions and say, we agree with reviewers in some respects about experiments that should be performed, but we realize that that is, like, let's say you have a reviewer who asks you to integrate a new mouse model to integrate, like, all the sequencing data. We may take a look at that and say, I think these are, like, obviously it would be great if every paper included these experiments, but it is clearly also out of scope for this study and um, would be an entirely different, uh, entirely new paper in and of itself. So we will overrule some of these requests when appropriate or out of scope. That being said, um, we will, uh, after we get this reviewer feedback and we invite a revision, it's because we believe that any major issues with the paper can be addressed in a timeline of three, roughly three to six months. And this can be what's termed as either a revised major or a revised minor decision. We do try to minimize the number of rounds of peer review. Um, so do, uh, address, do, do uh, make a good effort to address reviewer points, especially the ones that are emphasized by the editor in the decision letter, um, because that will save you the potential of a back and forth with reviewers and editors where one concern that we keep emphasizing has, is not addressed in multiple rounds of review. Do keep in mind that the goal of peer review, even if sometimes you may think the reviewers are being antagonistic, the goal of peer review is to improve papers and make them the best possible sell versions of themselves so then they can reach an audience and be treated and considered as an advance to the field. Um, so the goal of peer reviewers investing their time is to make sure that uh, robust and uh, well-conducted science is out there. But if you ever have any questions about review, reviewer comments, let's say a reviewer cites one paper and says this is something you should probably consider and you can't find that paper, you can always reach out to us and we can contact the reviewers on your behalf to get clarification. And in general, if you have questions or concerns about reviewer comments, if you think they're being unreasonable, always contact your handling editor and we can help resolve those situations. In terms of addressing the reviewer reports, again, make the most of your opportunity to revise. And we say that a revised decision should be in roughly three to six months. If it takes longer than that, that's fine. Um, you can ask us for an extension and in most cases we will grant it. But at the time you revise and resubmit a manuscript, you're expected to write what's called a rebuttal letter, where you essentially go point by point from reviewer concerns and say what you did to address those points. We would say, I would say, remember um, to make this letter as easy to read as possible so reviewers can, and editors can clearly find what you did to address their concerns as part of the revision. And so this means perhaps formatting the reviewer comments in a separate way as you're formatting your response, like either different bolding, different font colors, et cetera. Um, and if you have line numbers in your manuscript, indicate where those changes have been made as part of the rebuttal letter. Um, and again, remember to view the, remember that reviewers are, are meant to help improve the paper. If there are any points that have not been explicitly addressed, you should explain why and justify your reasoning and maintain a professional tone with reviewers. I will say, we, um, in cases where reviewers have unprofessional language, we actually will uh, remove it or ask them to rephrase that. Um, and so we expect the same thing of authors when communicating with reviewers. And I think a lot of people think that editors do not read rebuttal letters, um, but we do. And I've sent it back where I'm like, you cannot talk to the reviewer in this way. Um, I'm going to paraphrase here, but there was, because I'm being recorded, but there was one situation recently where, where someone said, like, well, the reviewer is full of poop in the rebuttal. So um, one example of a rebuttal letter is here, where you say, we're grateful to the reviewers, and you've clearly formatted um, the reviewer concerns versus your own responses, and perhaps even included the exact text that you've placed in the manuscript to address that concern. Um, I will say uh, there are cases where we may have to reject a manuscript after peer review. And this is largely because there may be too many technical concerns about the conclusions or the overarching experimental setup. Um, it may mean that the conclusions are overly ambiguous or perhaps misleading. Um, or in rare cases, it could be that the finding is not novel um, or does not present the novel advance that we thought it did over the existing literature. 
There are also some cases where we will reject a paper because uh, even though the experiments are kind of on paper feasible, it would take more than that roughly six month timeline. And it's in the best interest of the authors to submit to another journal that may not require those experiments rather than resubmit to us um, with, without the guarantee that we would then send the paper back to reviewers or ultimately publish it. I will say though, um, we are open to, uh, to appeals um, if you um, think that these concerns can be resolved. And this is true of both uh, d reject decisions before and after peer review. And so the reasons to appeal could be that you have additional data to address concerns from the editor or the reviewer. Um, you may notice uh, factual errors that you can back up with citations or by pointing out the data in more detail in reviews or editor's comments or if you have specific evidence of why a reviewer is biased. Um, and this may, it is more likely that you point out that they misinterpreted um, another study in their own comments. Appealing, however, is not the best choice when there are subjective disagreements um, about some of, the, some of the experiments or the, the concept of novelty or significance. And these are all paraphrased comments here, um, but they have happened in one form or another where uh, appeals may include language like, Referees are biased. I self-cite because I am the seminal author in this field. Um, or we've worked really hard on this paper. Or you personally or none of these reviewers are qualified to make this decision. Um, which I, I think goes back to the point of please, please maintain professionalism um, in, in any of these documents. Uh, if we do reject a manuscript, um, one benefit of being in the Nature portfolio is that uh, on a daily basis, I will be in contact with editors at other journals. And so there are times where editors at other journals will consult with me to say, this paper, it may not be a fit for us, but would you be interested in guaranteeing acceptance or sending this out to review? Um, and there are times where I will reject a paper and then consult other journals like Scientific Reports to see if the editors there would guarantee kind of expedited review or acceptance of a paper. Um, oh, also I will say we may, uh, based on our familiarity or conversations with these editors, we'll recommend a journal for transfer, but when we provide you with an option to transfer your paper, just know you're not locked in to a specific journal. You can go to any journal in the portfolio. And using a cue from my dog, Darwin, um, we also have the ability to transfer journals to, or reviews to journals outside of the Nature portfolio. So if you don't want to start the review process from scratch, you can contact the editors at um, your journal of interest and say, we uh, had this previously reviewed at another journal. You can contact my handling editor at this um, email address, and we can share the original reviews with them. Um, and we can also, if the reviewer is consented to this, we can share reviewer identities so they, that your manuscript can go back to those reviewers rather than a brand new set of reviewers. And so that's a lot of information perhaps at once, but main takeaways here would be the cover letter is important. Um, and can really help your manuscript in terms of articulating what is the clear advance of your study. You'll be assigned a handling editor who will guide you through the editorial process as an, and is there as a resource at every stage of the process. Um, and remember that we look for papers that can grow in peer review and the point of getting reviewer input is to make sure that papers can grow and are, are the best possible version they can be. So do make the most of your opportunity to revise. And at the end of the day, editors are taking responsibility for these decisions. That's why our names are published, along, are published on papers so that if you ever have questions about a particular study, you can contact the editor who had handled that paper. And we do consider appeals in cases where concerns can be addressed. That being said, um, I kind of said this before, but just to emphasize, the journey of a paper does not end at acceptance. So after we accept a paper and it goes through the production process, we are there to make sure that papers um, meet standards for transparency and reproducibility in the field. Uh, we have a production team who will make sure that it's in beautiful formatting to improve the final presentation. Um, and we're there to maintain the version of record of this manuscript. So if you ever need to, if you ever notice that there is perhaps a tweak to a figure that needs to be made, or if there are ever any concerns about papers, we're there to make sure that the correct science is being represented through our journal. We also promote your publication, again, through um, social media, through our journal platform, um, through being an indexed journal, which means it can be found through platforms like Web of Science or PubMed. 
um, will write press releases, do research highlights in social media. Um, and essentially, we try to make sure that once you've gone through the effort to get your paper published, that it can actually find an audience. And a few things, um, just in case you were wondering, uh, you may be familiar with preprints. Um, and I will say that the Nature Portfolio does support the use of preprints. Um, and I think when I was a graduate student, preprints were originally presented as a way to like timestamp your publication in terms of saying, like, we, we put this preprint online to say that we got here to this conclusion first. And I don't think. Um, like, I think like, there are some situations where that can be useful. But on the whole, I think preprints are actually just a nice way of disseminating your findings in your field like, as your paper goes through peer review. Um, so I see a lot of authors who will upload a preprint before a conference, and then they'll give a poster, or they'll give a talk and say, here was my overview of the, this work that I did. But if you want to hear the full story, here's my preprint. That being, uh, again, nature, Springer Nature and Nature Portfolio. Um, supports the use of preprints. And I will say that when we look over the advance of a paper and do that initial editorial assessment, we do not hold preprints against any papers. So like, you can submit a preprint, uh, or you can upload a preprint to uh, a server, uh, submit it for consideration in a Nature Portfolio journal, um, and we won't say, oh, well, you published this preprint. So like, clearly, you're just publishing the same thing twice. Um, and I, will, I should say, this may not be the case for every journal outside of the Nature Portfolio, so do check their standards about preprints, though most journals are preprint friendly. And we actually even have our own preprint service called InReview, where if you um, submit to that, you'll actually be able to track the progress of your manuscript in terms of how many reviewers were recruited, how many reviewers have submitted their feedback, et cetera, and get a more um, high resolution look at how your where your paper is in the publication process. But I'll also say, if you submit to BioArchive or another preprint server and are just curious about the status of your paper, always just email your handling editor, and we'll give you an update. Because again, we don't want you to think that your paper is just floating out there in the void. I will say, um, for there are some uh, limitations of just using preprints. Namely, preprints are not peer reviewed. Um, and preprint servers are supported by uh, kind of one-off grants. For instance, BioArchive and MedArchive are largely supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So that may mean that in a few, like, like this isn't meant to be like an apocalyptic statement, but that may mean in a few years' time they may uh, not have full funding, um, whereas journals are maintained in perpetuity. Um, there are no formal reporting standards for most preprints or formal mechanisms to correct or update those versions of record for preprints. And while, um, PubMed is currently doing a pilot study that I think has moved on to a second phase to index a preprint. So that means you can find preprints on, say, PubMed. That's not true of all indexing services like Web of Science or Scopus. I also think, uh, like, one, one other point before I'll open the floor to questions is um, there's been a lot of talk about ChatGPT. And our current policy from the Nature Portfolio's uh, perspective is that large language models or like ChatGPT um, or others cannot be listed as authors because they can tell you that you should leave your wife to be with them. That was the case, I, I forget if it was New York Times or New, York, New Yorker reporter. Um, but they cannot take responsibility for the content in your research publication. So if ChatGPT is used in a manuscript, it has to be properly documented in the methods. It has to be acknowledged in the acknowledgments, but not as an author. Um, we do, however, restrict the use of generative AI tools for images or videos, like Midjourney or Dolly 2. And that's because um, there, I, th there are some controversies behind this in that, say, um, these tools to generate images are using art or images perhaps without off, uh, the artist's consent. Um, so those cannot be used uh, on, for, in most cases. Um, the only exceptions would be if there's a piece that's explicitly about AI and generative AI, then like, you could include an image as an example. Um, however, again, here's a link you can click later on. Um, but this poli these policies could change in the future. And so. In case uh, you fell asleep during the talk, um, the things that you should take away from this presentation are one, your editor is there as your point of contact at any stage of the process. 
do let us know if you have any questions whatsoever. And as a not so subtle plug, um, do consider communications biology as a future home for your research. Uh, and as a final plug, I'll get to this more in the lunch and learn afterwards as well. But if um, talking about editorial careers uh, has kind of like sparked your interest in editing as, um, a as a career, uh, we do have an editor training program that uh, will be running uh, from September to October 2023. And applications are open until July 30th. And I'll talk about that later if there are questions. And so with that being said, Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Ed. Oh, OK. Sorry, I forgot about that. There you go. Also, I should say I only know Ed by name because we used to work in labs next to each other. Hi, George. Otherwise, that would be really creepy. How much time do you spend assessing the quality of a paper before you send it out to reviewers? I know you said the turnaround time is five to nine days, roughly. But how much time do you spend reading the paper, going into the literature, and determining whether or not you think it's significant enough for review? I think it really depends on the paper. Um, I think it can take at least two hours for highly interdisciplinary papers. But there are cases where, let's say, if it, it's a methods paper, and so it's very clear cut if they're including benchmarking, if, say, the performance of that method is very similar or not to others um, that are already existing out in the literature. So I would say it can range anywhere from like one to three hours per paper. And it depends on how, how like personally familiar you are with that topic. Um, so I'll say like as someone whose background is in mouse models of epilepsy, if there's a mouse model of epilepsy paper that comes across my desk, that is a, a, a fast assessment because I don't need to do as much uh, literature uh, or of a literature search for it. Thank you for the awesome talk. Uh, my name is Vishra. I'm in Takayama Lab here. Um, my question is, how do you go about finding appropriate reviewers for any manuscript? Do you have like a catalog of what PIs work in what field, or do you sort of know them off the top of your head? What's your process like finding appropriate reviewers? Yeah, so for finding reviewers, um, I think a lot of people will actually start off by looking to see the list of suggested reviewers. Our goal is. Like, if you suggest reviewers, um, we will reach out to ones that have relevant expertise. Sometimes people suggest like 10 reviewers, and only one of them actually is relevant to the paper at hand. Um, or they may suggest 10 reviewers who all have worked with them on active projects. Um, so those are clear conflicts of interest. But we may start off with that list. And at the end of the day, we may recruit one of those reviewers for input. But otherwise, we'll look for people who have either published on this topic, or we, we may be fam they may have previously published in communications biology, so their, their names float to our heads. Um, or we'll look at uh, just recent publications in other journals in this topic. Um, but we'll typically do like a, a, li a little dive into like PubMed or other databases to see who is published on this topic. Or if we're looking for, let's say it's a multi-omics paper, We'll look to pe at, with like metabolomics, transcriptomics, et cetera. We'll look at people who have expertise in just one of those techniques and say, we would ask if, like, we're curious if you'd be willing to review this paper. I know the whole thing is not relevant to your expertise, but we just want you to comment on this aspect. And then we would also tell you, um, uh, there, there's typically uh, at the end of a paper, there's some description of reviewer expertise. So we'll point out which reviewer was asked to comment on which part of the paper. Um, when you talked about what gets sent out for review, one of the criteria was significant findings. Um, and people have a lot of concerns about like, oh, non-significant results aren't published. Did you mean, um, what did you mean by significant there? So I should say it's not statistical significance in this point. And maybe I should change that, because we actually discourage authors from using the term significant when it does not directly relate to statistics in their own papers. <laughs> So note itself. Um, so significant findings just mean, does this add something new to the literature? Um, is it something where it's looking at an established pathway, but they identify a new role for a component of that pathway? Or they're identifying um, a new player in that pathway? Obviously, like th these are very vague examples, because, I, because it's hard to discuss them outside of the context of a specific paper. Um, or it could be a paper where, like there are many existing disease models for a particular disorder, 
but this is one that, ca that reflects one patient phenotype that has not been um, captured in other models. And so that's something new, at least from the perspective of communications biology. Um, I think we are not, a, I, I should say, we're not opposed to publishing null results. So again, when I say significant, it doesn't mean that everything has to be statistically significant. Uh, there's a question in the back. Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one is I wanted to know if there's a limit on the sections or how many sections you can use ChatGTP for. So I know you can't really use it for pictures, but like if you were to use it for multiple sections, is that frowned upon? And my second question is that do you have a flyer with the QR code for the training opportunity for the ed editorial program? So I guess to answer the second question first, um, I'll uh, send these slides to Christina. Um, and then she'll disseminate those afterwards. So you, you will have this hopefully like in the next day. Um, it's also, if you just Google communications biology, the link to everything on the training program um, is actually on our homepage. Um, so you'll be able to find it easily there. Uh, I will say, I said the deadline on these slides is July 30th. Um, on the website, it will say July 23rd because we actually just decided to extend the timeline for, for applications. So that will be reflected when I go home at the end of the day and update the website. <laughs> um, to answer your first part on the use of chat GPT, so I should say we, uh, I guess like th there would be concern, like, like we ask for transparency and if you use chat GPT, I think there would be concern, like we don't prohibit the use of it, but I think there would be concerns if you use it to write say your discussion section, um, or if you use it to write your results, because those are really areas where you should be critically evaluating the data yourself. I think perhaps there could be some value in using ChatGPT for the, like I've heard um, other researchers say they might want to use ChatGPT to write the methods, um, especially to avoid like self-plagiarizing their own work on those methods. Um, so I would say like while we don't ban it, be cautious about your use of ChatGPT, especially if, um, especially if it's a case where like someone puts something into ChatGPT and then doesn't actually fact check it. Um, much like the, the lawyer who wrote a brief, like I don't know if people heard the story, but there was a lawyer who wrote a brief using ChatGPT that made up fake like other cases and then the judge asked, oh, where are these cases? We don't know them. And the lawyer was like, oh, I didn't fact check this. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say we don't prohibit it. That may change in the future, but at this point, I think it would probably be most relevant to the methods section. Thank you. There's a question up here. Thank you, Christine. Um, so a great talk. Uh, so I was wondering, so at the end of the um, review process, and if you decide if you want to accept it or not, you said that if it doesn't get accepted, you can also suggest a transfer. Mm -hmm. um, is there ever a moment or a time where you get a, a paper and you're reading it and you're like, oh, this could possibly be not nature communications, but nature itself, I think, the other direction? So yeah, I think there's only one case where We've encountered that, um, and we did we did suggest it to that journal. Um, I don't remember if it was successful to that journal, but it can happen in reverse. Say so, it can happen in reverse, or you can. I've had it where um, authors will look at reviews for a paper and then say these are really glowing reviews. We want to transfer to another journal. Um, and in that case, I don't think it was successful. Uh, but like you can always like like at any stage you can decide whether or not to to transfer your, like your paper to a separate journal, um, even if it's a um, one of the more stringent journals within the Nature portfolio. So it would still go through another review process by if it was a so transfer. if you if you um, wanted let's say again you wanted to uh, like if if you wanted to transfer post review, um, we can give you a link to transfer all of your reviews, all of like the history of the paper to that other journal. Um, and so it doesn't have to start from scratch, but it would have to be assessed by the editors at that journal, unless we did a direct consultation with them and got like that, that yay or nay beforehand. Uh, I guess I have one more question. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, this is like a clarification. You said something about people not including whole institutions in their, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't quite understand. Why would they not oh, it, include the whole? So um, it could be that, say, one institute has uh, like a center for excellence or is really focused on one particular area of research. And so they say our direct competitors 
are literally everyone at this institution because they focus in this. Oh, I see. Um, and like we can consider individual names of researchers, um, but it, it, it may remove too many potential reviewers to exclude an entire institute. I see what you're saying. Okay. So like if someone said, don't send this to anyone at Georgia Tech, um, that would be excluding way more than six reviewers from the review process. Are there, oh, okay. Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned, you gave a few details on rebuttal letters mm -hmm. and going point by point. Uh, how do appeals, or how are appeals typically formatted? Are they similarly formatted? Um, yeah, could you give more details on, on yeah, the appeal so, process? So for the appeal process, um, if it's post-review, it's actually very similar to as if you were resubmitting your manuscript from a revision. Because as part of a post-review appeal, we would still expect that point-by-point -point rebuttal letter. Um, you may also include in your cover letter, there may be like a separate appeal form where you say, these are the reasons why, like, like in, in a more confidential document just for the editor, because the re reviewers would see the rebuttal letter, you may say, like, we are appealing, ba like, you'll see more details in the appeal letter, but, uh, or the rebuttal letter, but I want to point out that we are appealing because of these concerns about this reviewer, or I just want to point out that you said that this was the grounds for rejection, but we just want to say we added in that data and make it abundantly clear. So think about, about it as like for post-review appeal, including another cover letter just saying this is why we're appealing, and then the full rebuttal letter saying these are the exact things we did to change. For a pre-review appeal, so if it's something that was not sent out to reviewers, um, you could just say, like, basically an up, like, it, it could be that you have added in additional data, or you say, or the editor says, we are rejecting because we think there's significant, like, conceptual overlap with this study. And you may say, like, in an updated cover letter, then, um, we understand, uh, like why you were concerned about this paper, but we want to point out like the following distinctions and we're sorry if we didn't do this beforehand. So in that case, it's again, just like basically an updated cover letter. If you did add in additional data, you can mention that in the cover letter as well. Thank you.